what's going on podcasting world welcome back to another episode of the core consult rx podcast with me as always cole swanson and i got my good buddy here today ryan rosenblatt ryan what's up man hey thanks for having me absolutely it's good to have another student it's been it like is months Ryan's a fourth year student at MUSC. Hope you don't mind me telling the world that. That's fine. Yeah. Made it through the three wonderful years and now we're... They're so fun. We're, yeah. Now it's time to rotate. <laughs> Those yeah. are my best years. <laughs> <laughs> Sitting in a classroom being told what to learn. I'm yeah. still not sure what happened. Yeah, me either. It's blank the whole time. Can't believe they let me out. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, man. So Ryan has had the pleasure of starting off his fourth year with me. That's the way to month. do it. Just the way to do it. Cole did it, and look at him. There's only three of us. Started from the upper middle, now he's here. <laughs> <laughs> I think there's only three. Three that have started their um, fourth year with you, and two of them are here. That's right. Yeah, wow. Yeah, never had anybody else start with their fourth year. I'm just kidding. I don't know what he's talking about. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so today we're going to talk about UTI, and which is a super broad subject, but we're going to do our best, yeah. and, as always. It sounds... Um, easy in in a way it is kind of easy but i think we're going to do our best to make it as complicated as possible and now that cole said that we are absolutely going to get destroyed trying to do this <laughs> because he said it was easy i said we're going to make it complicated so get ready for us to look real stupid it's like an onion yeah it stinks <laughs> with layers <laughs> right yes it stinks with layers yes <laughs> hate onions <laughs> what a stupid food <laughs> I think it's a root. They put them on uh, the McDonald's bowl. cheeseburgers and ruin the whole day, <laughs> regardless of whether you ask for them to be taken off or not. So that's I don't a fact. mind them. It's really the, the pickles. I never understood. You don't eat pickles? Well, no, I do eat pickles. Do you but like, like um, whenever I. Russia too? <laughs> I'm skeptical. I think of your pickles. I think now. of the Chick fil A sandwich and I wonder what the pickles are doing there. Hmm. I don't know. I actually asked for extra pickles. I'm one of those <laughs> Is weirdos. That right? I'm one of those animals. <laughs> <laughs> I have to make the pre assembled chicken, <laughs> take it apart, and <laughs> add pickles to my sandwich. I know people who, if the pickle even touched the sandwich, mm. it's game over. They're yeah. not They're not even going to touch that thing. Oh. Well, I hate those people. So <laughs> <laughs> now the pickle lobby's coming for us. Yep. Yeah. Well, like, they are all of our pickle advocate listeners. Well, we're against sodium, right? We, we talk about blood pressure all the time. Do we? Yeah. Hmm. Uh, my brother actually thought that um, probably into his college years, the pickles came from like a pickle bush or some kind of <laughs> pickle tree. Well, you know, the uh, the famous the famous uh, <laughs> vegetable pickles. <laughs> that's how that works. They're, that's uh, funny. They're cucumbers. Is that the everybody. one that's a physician now? That is the one that's a doctor. Well, that's, you know what? <laughs> Just shows you. You turn it around. <laughs> yeah, you got to figure it out, I guess. You could turn it around anytime. Or not. It says something about physicians. Yeah, well. Yeah, you said it, not me. We, we love those guys <laughs> and girls. We do. All of them. The real doctors. Yeah. I got to set up an appointment with one soon because it's been a while. Got to keep that cholesterol in check. Yep. You're old now. In case I get a UTI. That's right. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Is that called a transition? Yeah, it's perfect. It's close. <laughs> right back to UTI. Uh, so where do we want to start? So uh, what is UTI? It's an infection, right? We're talking about urinary tract infections. Uh, any part of the urinary tract, and it is uh, kind of usually can present in two different ways, either a lower UTI, which is the more common, or an upper UTI, and that's uh, dependent on the site of infection. These are usually called cystitis for the lower UTI or pyelonephritis for the upper UTI. Uh, they present differently. So uh, generally, of course, UTIs, as you guys know, are more common in women, but they can also uh, occur in men. Uh, and large numbers of them may be asymptomatic. And so we'll talk a little bit about that, but um, spoiler alert, you probably don't have to treat it. Uh, so a lower UTI, the cystitis, you might see dysuria, urgency, frequency, uh, nocturia, suprapubic heaviness is common. That's commonly described. The upper UTI is characterized more by flank pain. So that's the um, the lower quadrants of the back, almost, I guess, where the, I guess you'd say where the kidneys are-ish. You might have some pain radiating there, um, as well as fever, nausea, vomiting, malaise. So it's just going to be a little more severe, and uh, they're going to be treated differently. So most infections are going to be treated by a, or caused rather, by a single organism. Um, so usually when we think of e, we think E. coli and we think UTI, um, but there's actually a lot of other bugs that can cause UTIs as well. Um, so there's different um, species such as like Pseudomonas, not real common, but definitely can be a culprit. Uh, group D, strep, 
Um, and then there's even things like H flu, salmonella, um, anaerobes. There's several different bacteria that can uh, cause a UTI infection. But I think typically speaking, I think it's as high as 95%, depending on where mm-hmm. you're looking, um, it's E. coli. Yeah, that's usually what you're assuming. Gram-positive-wise, there's also Staph saprophyticus um, is probably the most common gram-positive. Now, when you're, when you're talking about complicated, um, it's still going to be primarily E. coli, uh, but probably more around the 50 percentile, 50 percent or so, um, but then some type of enterococci is probably going to be the other culprit if it's complicated. Mm. So um, definition of uncomplicated cystitis or UTI. Mm -hmm. Um, So like Cole said, um, the urgency, frequency, dysuria, um, all those things that he mentioned. Um, And then uh, did you mention the absence of fever? No, I just said that um, pyelonephritis frequently has fever. Um, so if it's uncomplicated, just plain cystitis, not hadn't uh, you know turned into something more severe like pyelonephritis, um, absence, you have an absence of fever, um, but you still have that flank pain, like Cole said, and then um, the uh, would test positive when you test the urine, um, get a urinalysis, uh, test positive for some type of pathogen, typically um, that would show what's. Uh, what's actually causing the UTI, and that's how you can base your therapy. We always use empiric therapy, which is usually fine, um, but there's going to be some cases where we may have to switch the antibiotics after cultures come back. We actually had one of my first days at Fetter um, when I started there. We had a patient come in that had been given an antibiotic regimen for UTI. They got cultures then, um, and then four days later came back with worsening uh, worsening pain and all that. And they looked at the cultures and literally was resistant to every single thing they tested mm. against except carbapenems. Mm. Whoa. So they ended up having to like go inpatient in the IV. hospital. Yeah, yeah. Get IV antibiotics. So mm. did they have any idea where they picked that up? No, it's crazy. But I just, that was the first question uh, I got asked as they, as the clinical pharmacist, the veteran was like, Oh, uh, what now? Yeah. <laughs> and they had to be a list of uh, all the, just a whole list of R's. <laughs> just go to the, the ER. sensitivity report. I'd say it's time to be admitted. Yeah. Do y'all culture everybody? I, I don't think so. I, I think, yeah. I forget why they did specifically with this patient, but maybe they thought they were, were they older? I can't remember to be totally honest yeah. with you. I didn't get a whole lot of background. They just handed me the sheet and were like, Is this bad? <laughs> yes. Yep. <laughs> Super not great. It's a lot of R's. There's a lot of R's. R does not mean right choice. <laughs> Which so, so something that I picked up is that uh, you do you should culture pregnant women every time that mm-hmm. they come in with a suspected UTI, um, and then once you I believe the goal of a pregnancy is to have sterile bladder the entire time, and so they may end up on um, therapy several times over the pregnancy, and they should be tested regularly if they do show up with that. So, just wanted to mention that culturing uh, is going to be routine for them. Yeah. Yep. And we'll, we'll bring up pregnancy a little more with the treatment regimens because there are some of these that you want to avoid in pregnancy or at least in certain parts of pregnancy. Uh, and I figure you'd probably, so children and elderly patients are also considered complicated generally. So I figure they would probably culture them too on a regular basis. But, you know, not totally sure about that. So some risk factors, um, you know, when we talk about like premenopausal women, um, a prior history of UTI, um, spermicide exposure is listed, um, recurrent or um, excuse me, recent antibio- um, antibiotic use um, is also a risk factor. Um, and then when it comes to uh, like recurrent um, UTI, some of the other things to watch out for would be if w- women um, who have had a history of childhood UTI seems to seems to be a lot more prevalent when they're adults as well. Um, and then, you know, the things like um, whether or not they have some sort of a hereditary predisposition um, with their parents and, you know, family history, maternal history of UTI is listed on Johns Hopkins. Um, and then postmenopausal uh, things like, again, prior history, but also incontinence and then diabetes would put them at high risk for that because sugar accumulating in the, the urine is not what you want in regards to urinary tract infections. Nope. And as far as uh, defining like recurrent UTI versus a reinfection, so a recurrent UTI is two or more within six months or three or more within a year uh, in the absence of structural abnormalities. Seems like uh, seems like not many, you know, two and six months. Mm-hmm. I feel like that happens all the time. 
but that's technically considered recurrent. A reinfection, though, would be a UTI occurring um, greater than two weeks after the last, so that would be treated as a new infection, whereas a relapse would be a UTI that occurs within the two weeks from the original infection. Uh, so this would be either a treatment failure, you might have bacterial resistance like Mike mentioned, uh, or some structural abnormality. And I don't think we de- defined a complicated UTI, did you? Mm, no. Okay. So uh, yeah, usually the result of some predisposing lesion like a stone or an indwelling catheter um, or even prostatic hyperplasia in men. So this would interfere with the normal flow of urine and put you at higher risk for uh, a UTI. So I mentioned that it can occur in males. Um, um, and females and involve the upper and lower urinary tracts. Um, We were kind of discussing this earlier, but a lot of times uh, the men are uh, considered complicated just kind of automatically. Either way, they're going to be treated for a longer course than women. So we'll go through some of these treatment courses with the treatment options, but uh, generally you're going to do up to 14 days of treatment for a man, and you'll evaluate for a prostatic source if symptoms don't resolve at two weeks. And that's basically all you need to know about men and then the rest is kind of general for for both i guess yep so before we kind of get into the treatments let's talk a little bit about the urinalysis just because i feel like that's something that unless you're dealing with that quite a bit like the interpretation of it may not be super uh common to you so um just a couple things that you would you know look at you know that you'll get back on your analysis color things uh, like clarity turbidity uh, ph specific gravity ketones nitrites uh, leukocyte esterase uh, activity bilirubin there's there's several things so what does it all mean mike and that's what we're going to go through well we're going to go through the ones that have to do with uti <laughs> you're not going to tell us at all we're no. going to go through every one so strap in no but um there's obviously there's a lot of things you can deduce from a your analysis other than UTIs, but the ones that are going to be pretty... I can um, tell whether I'm hydrated or not. Yeah. You know, if I, if, if I got a headache and I go to the bathroom, it, I realize that it's I just haven't been drinking enough water. You can eyeball that. You can, Yes, you can eyeball that. <laughs> <laughs> Don't need a dipstick test. Perfect. <laughs> um, so one of the things, the color uh, of the urine, so red urine um, may obviously indicate um, that there is some type of... Um, you know, blood or, um, it can, can, can be due to medical conditions such as a UTI. Um, rhabdomyolysis can also make it, usually if it's rhabdo, it's, it's going to be so dark. It's almost like a Coca-Cola color. Red, isn't it, um, is it rifampin? Um, uh, rifampin is an orangish, like a bright orange. Okay. Yeah. So there Um, are some drugs that can discolor like, um, like azo, uh, or, uh, pridium. Yeah. Phenazepiridine. Phenazepiridine. Frequently discolor it orange. Mm-hmm. And so that's a good thing to mention to patients, especially if you've got a UTI, they just might figure there's something else going on. Yeah. Well, and, and also to like foods, like if somebody eats like a lot of beets in their diet, um, blackberries, things like that, then that also can, can, can cause the uh, urine to turn red. So it doesn't necessarily mean that the person has a UTI just by seeing the color like that. Also... I thought it was common knowledge that asparagus makes your urine smell funny mm. and a little bit brighter yellow, mm-hmm. but apparently it doesn't happen to some people. So really? I'd be interested to know why that is, because it definitely happens to me. Well, you know what? Let's just change this episode right around and start <laughs> doing some Google research, <laughs> this because is, I'm fascinated. Is, now get a genetic counselor episode. on, we're right. going to find it's out. Exactly. That's what we're talking about. People. Ryan, if you can go ahead and Google that for us for the rest of the episode. I think, I'm on I it. think it's genetic, because there's this Jamie whole, I know this whole family, they, think, they thought we were crazy, because, you know. Our pee starts smelling when we eat asparagus. Who thought, thought that? A normal thing. Oh yeah, I thought I thought that was standard. I think protocol. it is pretty standard, but there are some people they must just have some sips going crazy hmm. in there. You know what I mean? Yeah, that's cool. Anyways, Good for them. So that's so, as long so as we're talking about urine. I want to get more detail, but the first Google search does say that the ability to <laughs> smell the pee smell hmm. may be the difference. It may not be that it doesn't. Wait a minute. Happen, okay. Oh, but you can't smell it. That's definitely throwing a wrench into things. You know, this, maybe as you, you can't smell <laughs> smell my urine. I was gonna say, yeah, okay. <laughs> so huh. you're you're actually broken. <laughs> Thanks, Google. It, that goes into that whole like, you know, does everybody see the same thing? Oh, anyways, we're getting, we're gonna get psychedelic here, man. Crazy. So I, I, at least I'm not nuts. Like I, I, I think it's so. It definitely makes your pee smell. Just some people have bad senses of smell. So yeah. now that we've nailed that down, I think that's the most important thing about this whole episode. Y'all are welcome. Yeah. 
You just got some free knowledge. Five star review, please. Thanks. <laughs> yeah, that's what we like to hear. <laughs> that's what we like to say. Not that one star nonsense. Anyway, so yeah, I think you were telling us about the urinalysis. Oh yeah, what that, is that? What I was doing? <laughs> <laughs> I don't remember. Um, so you know, we, we won't go into like specific gravity and stuff like that, but um, uh, nitrite testing um, can be sensitive to a UTI um, as far as detection, but it's not going to be specific as far as an organism. Um, so, you know, normally you would not be able to, to detect nitrites in the urine. Um, so urinary nitrates are going to be converted to nitrites by bacteria in the urine. Um, and so a positive nitrite uh, result shows that you do have bacteria that is able to do this conversion. So you can kind of narrow down what's causing it. So obviously E. coli is a big one. Um, then things like Klebsiella, Proteus, um, Pseudomonas, some of the other ones we mentioned um, can all kind of do that. However, our gram positive, uh, like staph strep, things like that, cannot uh, convert this nitrate to nitrite. And uh, so we wouldn't see that. And then also uh, H. flu cannot mm. do it either. Okay. So it'd be a way of kind of getting some empiric data to figure out which you'd want to treat with. So basically positive nit positive nitrate, definitely have a UTI. Nitrite. nitrite. I-T-E. Definitely have a UTI. I don't know what it is, but it only occurs in, you know, about a quarter of patients. So yep. just because you have a negative nitrite doesn't mean you don't have a UTI. Right. And then uh, white blood cells, um, there is an enzyme known as leukocyte esterase um, that gets released after the uh, white blood cell uh, undergoes lysis. And so normally there's such a, such a small amount of white blood cells that, you know, the, the test... Um, like the test wouldn't show up positive. However, if there's a high number of white blood cells uh, in the urine, um, then you can get a positive result because it's being broken down um, and released. So, um, you know, it's something that, uh, again, doesn't necessarily give you a, a, an exact organism or anything like that, but um, shows that there's probably an infection going on. Um, and then, you know, we would be able to get actual bacteria typically in the, the urine as well. Now, that may be where we get the um, asymptomatic UTIs where we get bacteria, but the person's not having any symptoms whatsoever. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, that's that's a whole different story. But if the person's having symptoms, you do your analysis, get bacteria, um, then obviously then we need to start looking at treatment to get rid of it because your pee is supposed to be sterile. Yeah. And so, but a lot of it is like clinical, right? So if they don't have, if they don't have symptoms, then, and you're not concerned for um, like it, it advancing farther, then you very well could not treat it. Right. Um and mostly for the sake of uh, antimicrobial stewardship. Mm -hmm. So if you do have a negative dipstick test, you could consider a urine microscopy if the clinical findings are suggestive of a UTI. Um, so that's another option. Some other findings you might see, microscopic hematuria is found in about half of cystitis cases, uh, and then low-grade proteinuria is common in the setting of a UTI. Yeah, that's pee, pee sticks. <laughs> there you have it. There you have it. Uh, so treatment? Sure. Let's talk about it. So what are we trying to do when we're treating? So obviously we're trying to eradicate the, eradicate the pathogen, prevent recurrence, um, prevent and treat the symptoms because, you know, usually that's why you're even aware that the patient has it because they're complaining of it. Um, and then you know, per, trying to prevent collateral damage, so being aware of antimicrobial stewardship uh, with overly broad antimicrobial therapy, and I would also say prevent side effects as best as possible. So that's going to, um, so that your choice of antibiotic is going to play a role there. So we're going to talk about macrobid, bactrim, fluoroquinolone. So the common ones, um, I think that the, the biggest thing I learned in school when talking about UTI, um, when I got past the, you know, hey, so this is just how you treat it, is that um, these aren't benign drugs. And even though, like, I mean, man, I see these things constantly, like give them out like candy. Um, they definitely aren't benign and, um, you know, I mean, frequently patients will be given refills on these. And so it's like, Hey, you think you got a UTI? Just go ahead and it's refill it. Treat yourself. Treat yourself. Um, yeah, speaking of that, I've, I recently saw that like some places carry Uristat mm -hmm. stick. So it's, I'm not, there's no treatment method to it, but it's, I think I have a UTI. Let me go pee on a stick. And then you're able to give yourself some phenazepiridine. I don't know. What do you guys think about that? I think it's kind of like trying to treat yourself a little too much, especially because it's not diagnostic. It's just 
I think I have one. Which I, we are not women, so that I, I will I will say that I, I'd like to get that on the books I right think, now. At least I because <laughs> we're not. So I think if you talk to a, a woman, they do generally know. It's kind of like somebody who has chronic sinus infections or like recurrent sinus infections. They're like, yeah, I know I have a sinus infection. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, you know, you hear that from people and a lot of times when, whenever a patient says, oh, I know I have this, we're like, oh, okay. But I mean, like, you know, they usually do know when they have a UTI. Yeah. Um, so I say if they want to take some azo. Right. Sure. I mean, that's the thing. The, the finazoparidine is not really going to have right. any negative consequences it's to like it, taking so ibuprofen, why not? It's like taking ibuprofen, uh, which I'll even talk about a study comparing ibuprofen to antibiotic treatment. Um, well, what's your thoughts, Ryan? What, you brought it up, so what do you think? I, I think that using the azo, you know, short, short day supply couple days three days i think that's that's perfectly fine for a symptomatic but i just wouldn't want someone to take that and think that oh this is curing my uti that's yeah. true well that's and also true. too it may be something that it would encourage you know somebody who maybe to, to continually to continually seek out like antibiotics mm-hmm. just more so than they probably need to um i mean i guess if it's testing if it's showing a positive result then they do technically need them but i don't know yeah, I, I think that, I mean, to me, it's kind of a waste of money because if you think you have one, then you're going to have to pay the money to get tested anyway. So why not? Why buy the test first, yeah. get some low dose phenazoparidine, and then go to the doc? It just seems like it's easier just to go. I was going to mention this later, but I guess this is as good a time as any. But uh, this is a study that was published in the Public Library of Sciences. Never um, heard of it. Never heard of it either, but that's where it is. And Sounds it's official. Um, ibuprofen versus pivmacillinam, which is basically like a beta-lactam antibiotic, I think. Hmm. Um, this was in uh, May of 2018. But it was looking at ibuprofen, or like I just said, ibuprofen versus antibiotics um, in women with um, with a UTI Basically saying, okay, so can we avoid antibiotics in in some patients who are low risk? Can we just give them ibuprofen for symptom relief? Because that's ultimately what it is. That's all the patient is concerned about is getting rid of the infection quickly and not being uncomfortable. Um, and uh, the the results weren't necessarily bad, but I think that the conclusion was no, we really can't. So basically, the um, ibuprofen group, the, a lot of the cases did just resolve on their own and the, um, ibuprofen group, you know, they, the infection still resolved on its own, but they did have higher rates of it advancing to something more serious like pyelonephritis. So that's where probably anybody would say, well, don't really want to take that risk. Um, and also the infection lasted on average about two days longer. So if you, if you told a lady, well, you know, you can just even even without the advancement to something worse, if you said, well, you can just tough it out for an extra couple of days, it'd be like, I do not want to tough it out for an extra couple of days. Um, so, you know, it, so now, even though that I think that they could they are self-resolving sometimes um, in a lot of cases, it does need to be treated with antibiotics for the sake of not advancing to something worse, especially in a high risk patient and for um, not getting yelled at by patients mm. which is kind of like my daily goal that's key yeah yeah for sure i don't really mind it but it's like if i'm not getting yelled at i'm probably doing a good job i have a short fuse <laughs> <laughs> so i have very little tolerance for that no way yeah what are you talking about <laughs> all right so um one of the things to keep in mind now when we start talking about treatment is the resistance patterns of the bacteria so e coli um, is becoming more and more widely resistant to uh, fluoroqu- uh, fluoroquinolone specifically, um, also uh, Bactrim. So sulfamethoxyl trimethoprim is uh, still considered an option for UTI, but uh, it's something that you have to be careful with just because of the resistance patterns. Um, fluoroquinolones are no longer recommended as first line. Um, not only do they have tons and tons of potential side effects, they just seem to keep getting added on, uh, but the resistance is pretty pretty high. Yep. And it, I don't know if this is the same because I haven't worked there in a while, but I know at MUSC back in like 2015 or so, Cipro uh, was, uh, and then Cipro specifically was on some sort of, uh, uh, you had to get like basically an infectious disease doc to override like the, in the okay, the prescribing of it. It couldn't be just surprised. be anybody. Um and so they had a very specific criteria to follow in order to get it approved. But yeah, it, uh, along with that, some black box warnings I've heard about them being added on, but uh, tendonitis, tendon rupture, peripheral neuropathy, CNS effects. Um, these are potentially irreversible serious reactions, um, avoiding it in myasthenia gravis, which is a little more random. Um, but basically their FDA says reserve for patients with no other alternative 
uh, for acute bacterial sinusitis, uncomplicated UTI, blah, 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 blah. So so when I was an intern, I had uh, a patient come in. And you know how when you're an intern, you're just so ecstatic about counseling every single patient. Just oh, yeah. full, full of, uh, full of full, joy. Full of joy in life. No, but um, I was talking to this guy. He was, he was a real, like, you know, bigger jacked guy. So I knew you, you could tell he lifted weights like crazy. Um, and so I just told him about the tendon rupture thing because he was going to be on it for like 14 days or something like that. And uh, he was like, he just like was kind of staring at me weird. And I'm like, just finishing my, I'm thinking this guy thinks I'm an idiot, but I'm, you know, finishing my little spiel. And uh, he, he says, uh, that's really interesting. He goes, because I had this last year and he goes, this happened. He like pulls up his uh, sleeve because he had long sleeves on, like rolls his sleeve up and he had this, this huge scar on his bicep. Because apparently when he had been on it that, that year, he was doing like a lap, um, you know, pull down or something like that. And his, the tendon, his bicep tendon snapped. And he had to like Jeez. get it. Uh, he had to get it uh, like surgically reattached and all this crap. And so, I mean, obviously you can't officially say that's what it was. But the, I, if I was a betting man, right? <laughs> <laughs> What's the statute of limitations on that? Right, Ooh. coming back. Well, that's what it was. Was so it your pharmacy that dispensed it to him? It was, and I wasn't there at the time. But I was just kind of like, oh, so nothing ever happened. He never came back and sued. But I was like, God knows that's not what you want. You yep. got to counsel. Yeah, that's wild. But um, I know another person too that their uh, I think it was their uh, Achilles ruptured while they were on fluoroquinolones, so it actually happens, yeah. not just something it's in the not literature, fake, especially even in you know elderly patients. That's they're high risk too. Yeah. So, uh, anyways, first line treatment. So we're talking about uncomplicated cystitis. This is a premenopausal female who's not pregnant, no known structural abnormalities or anything like that. So, um, options. We already mentioned Bactrim. We already mentioned why. It's not necessarily preferred, but it is an option. So you do double strength backstrom twice a day for three days is an option. Um, there's also phosphomycin. It'd just be a three gram single dose. This has lower efficacy than some other agents. Um, it wouldn't work for pylo. So kind of what I see as being a frequent go-to and probably is my go-to is macrobid, 100 uh, milligrams twice a day. You can do it for five days. A couple of issues with it um, is if you suspect pyelonephritis early on and you think it might not necessarily be uncomplicated then macrobid is not going to cover that you're going to end up with a um a failed treatment and you're gonna have to treat with something else so you could argue that you know backstrom could cover both of those situations um also macrobid though generally considered pretty benign it's not necessarily it has issues so there are side effects associated with it one um is pulmonary toxicity uh, so that's definitely something to be aware of also um, pregnancy, not really one that you want to use in pregnancy if you can avoid it. So uh, none of these are benign, but macrobids probably for just a basic uncomplicated UTI probably my go-to. Yeah, I believe the another contraindication for macrobid is the creatinine clearance, mm -hmm. uh, 30 or less, 30 mils per minute or less. Yep. You want to stop that. I think that might even specifically be elderly. You want to double check on that. Which, which makes sense, right? Because I think a lot of people automatically assume it's the because we always think, you know, if your renal function is at a certain point, it's we're worried about toxicity because the drug's sticking around longer than it's supposed to. But in this particular case, that's not really the problem. It's because you're not allowing enough of the drug to get to its site of action. Mm -hmm. And so if you don't have a high enough creatinine clearance, then the drug's just kind of staying in the system and not actually getting in the bladder where it needs to work. Um, so that's really where that creatinine clearance uh, comes from as far as the cutoff. Um but the, there, there are some, kind of sp speaking towards elderly patients, there are some kind of weird adverse effects for uh, nitrofurantoin that I don't feel like are ever really discussed all that much. And the two that always stick out to me, there's several, but the two that always stick out to me for some reason is uh, pulmonary fibrosis and um, drug-induced neuropathy. And, yeah, uh, I knew there, that was the other one I was trying to think of, yeah. But they, um, you know, it's something that we almost never talk about, and and I know that some of the data that showed that is, is older and some people kind of scoff at it, but, um, you know, especially since we're using nitrofurantoin now as like prophylaxis and taking it daily, mm -hmm. it's something to consider if you have yep. an elderly patient. Um, cause that would definitely be the patient population that would most likely be getting prophylactic yep. nitrofurantoin. Um, and this is kind of, uh, you know, overkill. Most of you are going to know this, but there are two different 
salts that go along with the nitroferentoin. So you have the monohydrate and macro crystal. That's the true like macro bid. Mm -hmm. um, that's the one that you're taking twice a day. Um, not to be confused with nitroferentoin macro crystals by itself, the um, macro dentin, mm -hmm. uh, which is four times a day. Are they, aren't they like micro crystals or is it still macro crystals? Uh, maybe not. I, I believe thought they're both macro. Macro, okay, yeah. Both macro, yeah. Um, Maybe. Maybe it's a combination of micro and macro. You just I, never know. I, I thought that when I... Maybe it's you just like looking to see them alone. Yeah, yeah, I know. I, um, I see that quite a bit, though, is where it's prescribed. It's usually just a clicking of the electronic yeah. prescribing thing as an error, but make sure that it's being prescribed correctly. If you're Frequently, the doses are a little different. The macro day will be 50 milligrams. Right. The micro bit will be 100. Right. But five days, you're good to go. Yep. Otherwise, if none of those are an option for whatever reason, you can consider fluoroquinolones, though we don't like that. Um, also, beta-lactams, you probably want to avoid like ampicillin or amoxicillin alone, uh, but augmentin is an option in uncomplicated. Um, and augmentin is also an option in pregnancy. So uh, now we're getting into complicated situations. So pregnant female, what do you use? Want to avoid macrobid? Uh, you can use augmentin because beta lactams are generally okay in pregnancy. Uh, you could also consider a cephalosporin if you needed to. That would be okay in pregnancy as well. And uh, Bactrim can also be used, but you'd want to avoid it in the third trimester. Mm -hmm. And those are all for seven days. So a little bit of a longer treatment course, uh, like augmentin would be 500 three times a day uh, for a week. A little bit longer than in a regular uncomplicated situation. Yeah, breast, it's also found in the breast milk nitrofurantoin, uh, so that's something else to think about with, even though you're not using it in pregnancy, if, yep. the, if the mother develops a UTI after and she's breastfeeding, something to make them aware of, uh, the relative infant dose is low at 5%, so it's probably okay. I did have a question on that on rotation once upon a time where a mother, first-time mother, was very concerned about uh, macrobid and taking it, and we did some research, and I think she ended up going with augmentin, but, um, cool. so that was cool you brought that up, but... It happens. So, yep, it so you mentioned phosphomycin mm -hmm. um, earlier. So when I was in school, I feel like I remember this correctly without throwing anybody into the bus, that I was taught that phosphomycin was like one of the best drugs we could use. It was um, just expensive. It was just expensive. But... I so think I might have been told a similar thing. I kind of went into, you know, working that thinking phosphomycin is like my silver bullet for, for this one dose and yeah, yeah good one. to go. Um, but there was a study that was put out in JAMA in 2018 um, that compared nitrofurantoin to phosphomycin directly in uncomplicated UTIs and actually found that the um, nitrofurantoin group was significantly um, better compared to the phosphomycin. Um, so it had a little bit better efficacy and, I, and you know, we're, again, we're talking statistics, but still, um, significantly cheaper as well. So if you can get potentially better results, then that would be, um, probably a better option. And so it's something that, um, you, you know, it, keep that in mind that, that just because the phosphomycin is a one time drug and it does have pretty broad coverage, it's not necessarily something that's going to work superior to other drugs that we have right um but yeah I, I was surprised to hear that i remember when i saw that study i was like oh shoot <laughs> been recommending stuff wrong for three years <laughs> perfect <laughs> but um and then do you 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 were we were talking before we started recording about the uh potassium thing with bactrim you want to bring that up yeah so um this this is i think important so um there was a pretty large study done. This was back in 2014, and this is in the British Medical Journal, I think is what BMJ means. Um, so a little more a little more known than the uh, other journal. But this was Bactrim <laughs> and risk of sudden death in patients receiving um, inhibitors of renin angiotensin system, so like ACEs and ARBs. Uh, so basically they looked at like a, a lot of people, 40,000 people. Um, there were a little over 1,000 people uh, sudden, or they looked at 40,000 sudden deaths. So about a thousand of them occurred within seven days of exposure to an antibiotic. Um, they matched these to controls. They were looked at amoxicillin kind of as the comparator group, just being treated with amoxicillin. They also looked at uh, patients treated with Bactrim and Cipro and also Macrobid. Um, so the long and the short of it is patients who were taking ACEs and ARBs who were treated with Bactrim even in the within a week. So usually we're like, oh, it's a short course, no big deal. Um, there was a significant increase in risk of sudden death. 
Um, so they didn't know exactly why. They think it's related to um, increases in potassium in that time. A lot of these patients were elderly. Um, the number needed to harm with back from versus amoxicillin came out to about six, which is like not very many. Uh, Cipro, uh, we were talking about issues with fluoroquinolone. Cipro, there was also a significant increase uh, in risk of sudden death. It was lower than Bactrim, but there was one. Strangely, when you go into the supplementary um, appendix, the majority of patients who were uh, taking Bactrim and the ACEs and ARBs also were on Lasix, which doesn't really make sense, especially when you could consider that they think it was because of increased potassium. With the Cipro, it could be QTC prolongation potentially. Um, in that seven-day range, Macrobid actually had a lower risk of sudden death compared to amoxicillin. Uh, this might be because, like we mentioned earlier, it can't be used for complicated infections, so maybe there were more mild infections. But when you push it out to 14 days, uh, the Macrobid did have a slightly higher risk than amoxicillin. Bactrim still maintained that number needed to harm around six, even at 14, uh, going out to 14 days of treatment. Cipro um, was a little lower than the seven days worth but um, still higher than amoxicillin. So I think that's important to consider. And this is, I mentioned they were elderly patients. This is specifically patients 64 and older. So if you have someone 64, 65 and older who's taking an ACE or ARB, especially a high dose, maybe they're also on potassium. Maybe they've had issues with hyperkalemia in the past or um, acute kidney injury. Um, maybe Bactrim isn't their best option because, uh, you know, nobody likes sudden death. Here's the thing about sudden death. It's not. It's not my. Good. I'm not a fan. Not I don't. A I don't support it. So ever since then, I'm always. I'm always weird about like if I'm, if I don't have to fill it. I'm always a little weird if I see like less than a pro because it comes up as a severe interaction, mm -hmm. like just mm. on my computer. We all override it like crazy. Just override it like crazy, and um, I don't know. Just it, it's done all the time, which is frustrating. Uh, sometimes it it can't be avoided. Um, you know, you might consider, even consider depending on the situation, holding one of them, if it's only going to be like five days of treatment, holding lisinopril or something like that. I don't know what the answer is, but um, yeah, definitely con a concerning study. Would you? What would you counsel the patient on at that point? See, that's the thing. So, yeah. hey, listen, so if, if you experience you any sudden death, right, you you're going to want to stop the lisinopril right. stat. So that's like there's... it's Call your doctor. That's why it's like... He'll know what to do. There's a lot of frustrating <laughs> things. Me. I'm not going to go into a soapbox now about um, community pharmacy, but there's a lot of frustrating things where you have there's nothing you can do um, except like refuse to fill it. And it's like the doc's going to be like, what you seriously refusing to fill Backstrom for yeah. a UTI, you know? Um, so yeah. How can you counsel there? You really can't. It's just, you got to go with it and um, hope that nothing bad happens. Yeah. Fingers crossed. Yeah. Keep that. That's what I do. I, I approach, Keep the fingers crossed. Um, I'd say 90% of my day like that. <laughs> <laughs> So anyways, yeah, I mean, that, that, that is true. Like, what are you going to do? Get, like, there's no shot that the, the, I would say pretty much no shot that the physician is going to want to change it yep. based on that. So, yeah. And, you know, you have to trust that the prescriber is aware of their labs. Got a potassium level. Got a potassium level at some point, knows that it's under control. Um, you know, I'm sure if I dove deeper into the study, you could probably, hopefully they would have pulled potassium levels unless they didn't link that up until afterwards. But anyways, yeah. so finishing up on this um, complicated stuff. So if you're not pregnant and it's complicated, like we mentioned, that might be um, because of some type of stone or other structural abnormality. So Bactrim can be used to treat a complicated infection. So this is where you're getting more into the heavy hitters. Um, you'd want to do the double string twice a day for seven days. Uh, the fluoroquinolones are also an option, Cipro and Levo, um, and then Augmentin. So of those, um, I don't know, I, I kind of like Augmentin for it, but it kind of depends. It just depends on the patient. All those are options. You do Augmentin 500 three times a day for a week, just like with the pregnancy. Uh, and then you can um, also do fluoroquinolones. Mm-hmm. Yep. Just get prepared for that diarrhea action with that Augmentin. Mm-hmm. That is what it is. Yeah. That's the thing about drugs. None yeah, of them are perfect. They all cause diarrhea. They, they, that is true. Hundred percent of them. So now that we brought up diarrhea, I will bring up um, oh something boy. sexual. Oh so boy. if <laughs> if you if you have recurrent infections that are uh -huh. associated with intercourse, which this mm. is a very frequent thing, recommend uh, that the patient voids immediately after intercourse. Um, and there was also a recommendation to consider adding um, a patient administered single dose of Bactrim after intercourse and after intercourse if intercourse is infrequent. 
don't know about all that. I would start with the voiding <laughs> thing. Uh, and, you know, maybe if you can avoid somebody being on like constant prophylaxis of half strength backstrom or half strength um, macro bid, that would be great because sometimes people have to do that. Uh, but yeah, I, I would probably start with the voiding thing. Yeah, for sure. And that means to urinate. What? Yeah. Huh. Seriously. McTurition. <laughs> yeah, I was about to say it. <laughs> <laughs> Jeez. <laughs> pulling out the... Bunch uh, of nerds. <laughs> pulling out the uh, medical terminology. True. Take, takes, takes us back. <laughs> Excuse me, sir. I must micturate. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be right back, guys. I have to. <laughs> um, the other thing is to uh, we mentioned fenazepine a couple times, but um, and this kind of goes back to Ryan's initial point. You probably don't want to recommend that they have just a endless supply of. Um, phenazoparidine sitting mm-hmm. around because the concern is you really can uh, mask the uh, symptoms of a UTI. And so you take away that uh, pain, then the person doesn't realize they have it, the infection gets worse, potentially spreads. So um, that would be another reason to not use like the azo pain or have like three boxes mm-hmm. of it ready to rock. Yeah. It's kind of like Tylenol in kids if it's masking a fever and the fever is important diagnostically. Mm. You know what I'm saying? Or if when you give kids baby aspirin. <laughs> Yep, don't do that. See that? We don't recommend it's that. Little, it's a little rye syndrome humor <laughs> yeah. at the end of the podcast. <laughs> all, you're, wel- you're welcome. All about the rye syndrome You're humor. welcome. Somebody's, somebody out most there of my had ma- rye syndrome, most of my they're material. very upset. Well, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> don't take it personally. Yeah. I'm just running out of stuff to say on here. So yeah, we talked a little bit about azo. So the over-the-counter azo, like the highest strength is like what? 95. Like, like right under 100. Mm. Um, and then frequently the, pres- the prescription. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Like when five, I looked on the back, I think enough. it actually said like 99.8 or something it's like 95. that. 95. Okay. Oh, whatever. That's it. I'm Googling it right now. <laughs> Stand by. Um, and then so the, the prescription is usually 200. Um, a lot of times it's like three times a day with food. And usually not for more than like three, three days or so. Something like that. What did you say it was? Well, I said 99.8. Okay, so we're both wrong. It's 97.5. I knew it was something weird, ah, we're all right? stupid. I knew it was something weird. I blame Ryan. I literally looked on, fault, on the back because I was like, somebody prescribed... <laughs> it's better. Now you've apologized. Somebody prescribed Phenazepurity in 100. We didn't have it because, you know, we don't care because mm-hmm. it's over the counter. So I just went over there to just double check what the dose was. And you just Mine. start pulling stuff OTC. I think, oh, I know what we should talk about impromptu before I forget. Cranberry. Yeah, we, oh, oh, shoot. Yeah, can't believe we, we not, almost just ended this oh without talking God. about cranberry. How did we not talk about cranberry? Jeez, Ryan. <laughs> <laughs> I almost brought it up. What? Yeah, this is your job, man. Oh, my gosh. So, let me quickly If Amelia was here, she would have crushed it. (laughs) She knows everything. She She doesn't need us. She makes me feel stupid. (laughs) So, cranberry. Cranberry. Yeah. Um, Okay, so there is some voodoo magic out there that says that cranberry will prevent you from having UTI. There's some really weak literature that shows that. And basically, the thought process is the cranberry will keep the bacteria from being able to stick to that bladder wall yep. and, and cause the infection. Um, it doesn't like kill the bacteria themselves or anything like that. But the problem is when they've done studies, and they did one recently. Actually, I did a flash briefing on this for Amazon's Alexa probably eight months ago, nine months ago when that study came out, but they did like a uh, meta-analysis, I believe it was, and uh, looked at all the studies that have, and they're all really small studies, that have looked at cranberry and found that there's really no uh, true evidence that it works. I think some of the like evidence that people usually point to, it was a small study and it was specifically patients um, in a nursing home, mm-hmm. so in a assisted living facility or assisted living facility. Um, and a lot of them had indwelling catheters. So mm. maybe if you have that specific situation, whatever. But for the general public and prevention of UTIs, there wasn't anything strong. Uh, but, you know, generally safe, right? So it's not like... Unless you have diabetes, then don't be pounding cranberry juice. Yeah. Or, I mean, you know, if somebody wants to do the over-the-counter supplements or whatever. No. If they want to waste their money on it. <laughs> if they really feel feel good about it. Hey, you know, who are we to tell them do? they can't waste their money? But... Probably not going to do too much. Speaking of which, are you guys familiar with Urabel capsules? I don't even know if they still. Yeah, that's they still, like the. Um, there's a generic for it. There's like other other brands. There's for it three too different stuff. drugs like methyl and blue. Yeah. And stuff like that in there, yeah. right? Yeah. So it has. It's actually. Yeah, give me some knowledge five, about that because I've been know. trying to look it out because I remember dispensing it and feeling bad that we charge someone a hundred dollars for it when for, there's not much going on for potion for yeah. which potion. <laughs> so. Hyosiamine's in there. Huh, okay. Um, well, which that might help with that. Antispasmodic, so that might be symptom relief. And then uh, methanamine, methylene blue, phenyl salicylate, and sodium phosphate monobasic as an acidifier. Hmm. So they've got a lot going on. It sounds like they just mixed all the different weird voodoo magic into a drug that is just has a bunch of side effects. So and this is for the most part for symptom relief, right? Correct. Because I mean I see it relatively frequently and 
I, does it turn your urine blue? Is that a? I I saw. I, th- I, th- I mean, if it's methyl and blue, it's in there. Yeah, I, would I think fi- it could. Well, I, I wasn't sure if that was just because you know if I was just assuming that because it was called blue. But I was in an office one time. That's and, basically what my answer was based on. Right, I was in an office one time and a lady did a it was, you know pee in a cup basically. It says methylene blue turns your urine green. <laughs> green. Okay, it was like <laughs> it was. It was <laughs> darn it! Darn those primary colors. They got us. Blue plus yellow. Oh no! Green. <laughs> oh no! That is very true. Oh, we're so stupid! <laughs> wow. Uh, but yeah, I mean, her, her, her urine was, I guess maybe it was a bright green. I thought it was a bright blue, but it was mm. very uh, not colored correctly. It was a propofol color. Yes. And we did not give her any propofol. <laughs> uh, but whenever I dispense this, I think with Bactrim, it can actually precipitate and like increase your risk for a kidney stone. Hmm. So, um. It's not what you want. You know, I've, I've never actually seen that happen before, but it actually came up as like contraindicated hmm. interaction on, you know, our little system thing. So I don't really love those together. I'd probably say, you know, ibuprofen or, or azo or something. Go big or go home. Methylene and blue all day long. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, that's interesting because we um, that's not an uncommon drug. It's a good call, Ryan. Yep. Yeah. That's why you're here. What Made you know? up for the cranberry. Just, just to wrap up on the pea asparagus. Okay. Oh, yeah. Oh, sure. oh, yeah. It's yeah. good. We, we looked, we're going full circle here. So <laughs> the BMJ, we're back in a okay. reputable journal. Oh, good. Uh, back in November 2016, did okay. a uh, genome wide association study hmm. and found that 58% of men and 61.5% of women have asparagus anosmia. They can't <laughs> smell it. Anosmia. <laughs> That's, I love it. That's definitely that's a real not thing. a word. And it's a genetic uh, nucleotide polymorphism on chromosome one. So you that might be on your twenty three and Me. I wonder if it would. be. Wait a minute. Ooh. You're telling me that fifty eight percent of men cannot smell the asparagus the bats? in your pee. We have got to do some real life studies here. One thousand four hundred forty nine out of two thousand five hundred men. I'm glad that. I married a woman who can smell the asparagus. Yeah, well, do because because you think what a disaster that would be if you're like, no, I'm good to go. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you get you get home and next thing you know, yeah, your wife's throwing you out. <laughs> that is so. Uh, that fascinates me. That's yeah, not good. No. Hmm. I thought that was way 58% more percent of people have no clue and that are waking out, everybody out. turns out if you get something published in the British Medical Journal, you can make up a word and then it becomes medical That's terminology. True. That is a knows me. Honestly, I think we need to start coming up with words. Yeah. That should be a top priority of the podcast. Is that what now, they're honestly? doing over there in Britain? They're literally studying who can smell the asparagus urine? There's, who there's not a lot to do over there. <laughs> 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 Everyone that listens to us from, from England just... We actually have a lot of... Just sign off now. We have a lot of listeners from over the pond, so we like you guys. You know, yeah, you know what's ridiculous is our fourth or fifth highest like group like ge- geographically uh-huh. is Australia. Australia. Yeah. yeah. Isn't that yeah, crazy? A couple of them reached out to us on Instagram recently. Well, they're all evidence-based over there. They it, said mate, just like I thought they right, were. It was awesome. Call us mate. Because <laughs> uh, when we were trying to name the podcast before we just went with That's right. Poor Consult Rx, there, we Which wanted to call no it. makes no sense. Terrible branding. <laughs> let's make a word that doesn't make sense. <laughs> so, it's my bad, guys. <laughs> so let's see if somebody can Google, Google us and pull us up. Yeah. Evidence-based medicine? No, it didn't work. Oh, I'm going to type in core. Core, core. Like, like C-O-R-E. Okay, okay. two words. Like, right. No, no, no. Nope. A fake word. No A. Fake no word. E. <laughs> no Anyways, E. Put them together. There was a, Two um, We wanted to call it the Evidence-Based Medicine Podcast, so it would be EBM. Yeah. That's pretty easy, right? Yeah. Already been taken. Mm. It's an older podcast. I don't even think he records anymore, but it was an Australian guy. He, he burned out. It's quality stuff, but um, yeah, so that's great, why. Great accent. Automatically added That's, that's IQ probably the down. only reason we did not name it evidence-based medicine podcast. it was he was on episode two and we were like ah yeah. shoot we were like he already did it <laughs> he did it well we can't that's the end of that we can't done. be posers simpsons did it uh, right. uh, what's ridiculous is we didn't know how the game works but back then yeah now it's like how many people have right ripped off our thing and, and even uses they even use our logo in one of them it's just hilarious <laughs> he's the, the magnifying, the magnifying glass. glass i was like ah look what you did there it's really really neat um. You guys are detectives. <laughs> <laughs> We're detectives for medicine. You guys are detectives for medicine. Cute. Oh, man. Uh, that's great. That made me laugh really hard. <laughs> did it really? <laughs> it did. For so, a couple days. Yeah, this was a good one. We uh, So obviously we focus more on outpatient treatment. So yeah, obviously you can't be hospitalized for UTI. We're not going to go really far into it. But Mike mentioned aminoglycosides. So there are um, situations. Carbapenems. Or yes, he mentioned carbapenems, but aminoglycosides are also another option, uh, as well as other IV things like fluoroquinolones, blah, blah, blah. You might see a lot of that kind of stuff. Um, and uh, also, if you can, yeah, that's pretty much all I have. There's IV stuff like beta-lactams, aminoglycosides, carbapenems. We're not going to get into all that today. Yeah. 
I like how you said we're not, we're not going to go very deep, like or well, or at all. I was just throwing the options. <laughs> no, it was great. I appreciate the enthusiasm. Yeah, they're they're there. We'll retitle this outpatient UTI. Yeah, we could do that. Yeah, probably. Well, it turns not. out we haven't come up with a title yet, so <laughs> I do that on the on the fly. It's on the fly. It's usually pretty much. It's just, pretty exciting to me to wake up the next morning and say, "What did Mike title the podcast uh-huh. this time?" Or what did he do? <laughs> yeah, what did Mike do? <laughs> So usually I'm like pulling stuff out that's not like we never talked about. I was like, ah, I forgot we said that. And it turned into an Instagram post. It's, yeah. It goes off the rails about midnight here. Oh, jeez. Anyways, so it's been like two weeks since we did this. So it's good. Yeah, it's been Glad a we while. got one out. Yep. Thanks for having me. Absolutely, Yeah, Brian. Absolutely, man. You're the man. And uh, this is after a full day of rotation. That's right. Dreams just, come true. Of just doing all the, my work for me, which is really convenient for me. <laughs> Opens my day right up. Mike I know. Just, it's like there's three of you. It's weird. Mike literally <sighs> sleeps all day. Except mm-hmm. these days, he just goes to the gym while Ryan's doing all the work. Because Mike's been working out. So Trying to get less fat. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Guys, I appreciate you guys listening. As always, seriously, uh, we were just talking about this the other day. I can't believe even like three people listen. So um, I think just this year alone, we've had over like 60,000 downloads. So at least four people listen. So yeah, at least four people listen, at least on Instagram. (laughs) And uh, the, uh, but no, we've had over 60,000 downloads of the podcast this year alone. and, And that's been pretty phenomenal i mean we've, we haven't even put out that many episodes so um super appreciate everyone taking the time to listen and passing the the word along to your friends and colleagues and uh please if you guys do like it leave us a rating or a comment we do enjoy looking at those and uh if you have any questions please reach out to us on email um any of the social media platforms instagram's probably the easiest to get us um but all you know twitter and whatever else but uh you know, if we don't get back to you quickly, it's Cole's fault. And then it's always my fault. I'll follow up as quickly as I can. But uh, no, we try to hit everybody back, but I'm sure we missed some. So I apologize if we haven't wrote you back yet. But um, anyways, thanks. And we will catch you next time. Later.